All right. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, I, I have I have the uh, very unenviable task today of uh, convincing all of you that integration is sexy. Uh, and I've had a number of people comment on the title of this. Uh, it's uh, a, a very difficult thing to do. Um, uh, but but hopefully I can use some data and some arguments and some you know discussion about the trends in the world uh, to indicate why why we're so excited about this market, why we've been building a company in this market, um, and and where we're going next um, as a result of this. Uh, I am fairly new to the company, as Hasman said. I just joined about a year ago uh, uh, as as its CEO. I've been in and around the company since 2010. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, work closely with the, the founders um, and Sanjeeva to, to help do some investment in the company and be on the board for a very long period of time. And, and prior to that, you know, I, I've spent 20 years in and around the middleware market. Uh, I started my career uh, doing middleware and integration projects. I worked on Corba. Uh, you know, I still have nightmares about that technology base. Um, uh, wrote books on Java, uh, which which was a you know a very fun and fascinating time of my life, and and I've done a bunch of investing, and and this is the third time that I've actually been a CEO at a company, and and I've always been attracted to the te the companies that have the hard technology solving the hard problems, um, and finding a way to make a little bit of profit as you go. So I like to talk about myself as caring about the bits and the cents. Um, uh, this is my first AsiaCon. Uh, but, but we do three events a year. We hold a con in the United States. We hold one in Europe. And, and this year, it's particularly exciting. We will have more than 1,000 attendees across our various events this year. Uh, that's a significant step up for us. Uh, we've also been co-hosting it with the Ballerina Con. Ballerina is a programming language that, uh, that, that we've been working on and incubating for, for quite a while. And, and even after the end of this event, we're hosting a Ballerina Day. Um, here and, and I'm just utterly stunned. We have almost 800 people registered uh, to spend a day with us learning how to program in this new programming language. And I just cannot even fathom how you get 800 people into one room all doing programming at the same time. I, I don't know. I'll just have to see it. But uh, obviously there's some momentum and interest and, and we've had a very nice progression. Um, along, these, along these lines, just a couple of days ago we became a teenager. We're 13 years old now. It's really fantastic. This uh, shows a lot of maturity in and around the company. You know, we told all of our friends that, hey, now that you're a teenager, you know, you can go out with other open source, but you can't mix together without parental supervision around. Um, it's very important here. Uh, we're getting older, we're getting more mature. So, uh, I'm not the only one who thinks uh, integration is sexy. Uh, Massimo is a very well regarded uh, specialist at Gartner. Uh, he's been there a lot of years, and right after the MuleSoft acquisition by Salesforce.com, he goes, holy moly, what's going on in this space? Nobody talks about the integration market. We had this thing called MuleSoft go public, and now they're getting bought by Salesforce and Binioff, of all things. Um, this is a hot market, and it turns out that MuleSoft was one of the highest value rated acquisitions of enterprise software of all time on a valuation basis. The numbers just don't add up, um, in many, as, as, as many things that Binioff does doesn't add up, but in this case it was really one of the, the bigger acquisitions of all time, and suddenly people started saying attention, paying attention, you know, hey, what's going on in this integration market? And we were very excited by this because this really leaves us as definitely the largest remaining open source integration vendor that's independent on the marketplace, and we're generally just one of the largest overall independent integration vendors that's left, and on top of that, we're into a market that's about to explode. And let's talk about why. Now, Massimo believes this is so significant that in two years, 50% of all your digital platform, digital transformation projects are going to cost from a headcount or a, a, a dollar basis uh, related to integration, right? If you are doing some sort of digital transformation project, that project is going to be integration. We're going to talk about why that is, but if this is the case, if we're going to cross that 50% threshold, then really what you're doing is every time you commit to a project, that project is an integration project. It doesn't matter what kind of software you're going to build, you are doing integration. So we're down this path of all software development is becoming integration, right? If you have a core competency, it's going to be integration. Now, why is this? 
Uh, there's a lot of different theories and reasons around it. Uh, uh, and, and, and we're going to you know, narrow it down to just two big ones that are going on right now, data and scale. Right? Now first, there is a massive market trend around machine learning and artificial intelligence. And these are fundamental trends because artificial intelligence is a way that organizations can take the data that they have and create innovative recommendations that they can use in it to differentiate themselves from their competitors. And so most companies are scrambling down this path to be able to mine their data and extract it and utilize it in very compelling ways. But in order to do that, you first have to feed these machine learning algorithms with the data itself. And so you have to consolidate these data sources and integration is a backbone in which how you bring these data sources together to feed your machine learning algorithms. Big major trend and this is a big driver of what's going on behind the scenes. But more importantly and even more substantially is this scale problem. Now we've gone over a couple of decades and over these decades consumer applications come along and the demand for those consumer applications increase. And as the demand for those applications increase dramatically, the architectures that those companies have to build must scale to meet that demand. And the way that companies have been uh, achieving this scale is that they have been disaggregating their internal architectures piece by piece by piece. And they break them into components. And when we talk about APIs, APIs is one form of how you disaggregate your architecture. And you do this because there's a lot of benefits associated with independent deployment of the component, uh, independent scaling of the component, and general uh, uh, self-organizing development teams. And so this trend has happened because of APIs, and it's continuing to happen around these trends with microservices and serverless architectures. So you end up with these organizations that have dozens or hundreds or even thousands of these components that are making up uh, they're scale-based systems. And if we were to zoom in on what's going on, all these different components communicate with one another with integration, right? Integration is this hidden glue that is making these things all work together. And it's keeping them resilient, it's keeping them organized, right? And it's giving them this backbone of communication that's there. The interesting thing is, is that we're on this inevitable trend of higher forms of disaggregation, so the number of pieces that we have to bring together is growing exponentially. And so the demand for integration is really the glue that brings together the whole world. When the pundits like to talk about what our future is, whether it's cybersecurity or a big data future or a cloud future, what they're really talking about is how do we build bigger systems of scale. And the more we need to scale our systems, what we're really saying is that this is a euphemism for, I need to buy a lot of glue. I need to buy a lot of integration. And this is where we're at. And so it's no wonder where it's snuck up on us that this integration market overall is $34 billion in size. It's, it's huge. And it's growing at a big amount. Now, we get to play in this market, and I frequently get asked the question, hey, you know, how do you break down the integration market? How do you separate who's doing what? Are you guys an iPaaS? Are you a knowledge-based system? Are you a load code system? What do you guys do? How do you fit into this world? The press is starting to pick up on all these different integration vendors and they give different levels of hype to different categories. And I like to break it down very simply into three ways. Uh, the first is, hey, there's knowledge worker integration. I'm, I'm some dude and I need to integrate my systems, my personal systems with other sources of data that I have access to and I need some sort of low code or individual self-service mechanism where I, whereby I can go and integrate uh, my own personal systems. And there are some companies, really fantastic companies that have sprouted up um, in this self-service individual integration mode. The next step up is that you have companies who say, hey, you know, we have internal applications or maybe we have some cloud apps and we need to do some app-to-app -app integration. I may be responsible for an SAP implementation and I need to integrate it with NetSuite, right? And I'm looking for a, a prepackaged, quick form integration that I can deploy so that I can implement whatever business processes that I've got using these two systems. And, and we've seen some really interesting low code and integration platform as a service vendors crop up 
In fact, there's 175 of these guys in the marketplace competing for a small amount of dollars, $600 million, trying to do these point-to-point -point integrations. Okay, that's interesting. But then you upgrade one more step, and then you start to look at all the organizations that call themselves digitally driven orgs, or software driven organizations. And you may ask, hey, who are these companies? And the answer is all of us. And the reason that it's all of us is because I believe fundamentally in Mark Andreessen's hypothesis, which is software is eating the world. And if you've you know, listened to his hypothesis, he basically believes that all companies in the future are going to need to depend upon software as their mechanism of differentiation. And if software is gonna be how you compete in the world, then you are going to need to have software development as a core competency. All companies will have software development as a core competency. More, doesn't matter whether you're healthcare or insurance, finance, automotive, manufacturing, software is your core competency, and Sanjeev is gonna talk about that in his keynote. Right? Well, if you're one of those organizations, we call them digitally driven orgs, right? And if you're a digitally driven org, your development teams need to become as agile with integration as they can be. And as, in order to do that, they need an integration backbone. And there are vendors that have been working on these integration backbones for a long period of time, and they make some big ones, they make some heavy ones, they make some expensive ones. But the world that we're moving to is a lightweight one a lightweight world of microservices, serverless functions, and APIs, and guess what? You need a backbone, but you need a backbone that is as light as the architectures that you're gonna build, and you need one that's also going to be done in the open with transparency, and that's open source. And that's us, that's WSO2. We're this vendor for the future. And we've been getting good at this. Uh, we now have more than 450 customers, in the past year, we've added 120 customers. Um, and I think just now we crossed over 500. I see we've updated that number there. We have worked on over 2,000 projects in our 13 years, and all we do are these integration projects. We're now building up a substantial experience. We run massively large systems. Um, at StubHub, they're now running 1,000 transactions a second through our API management capability. And over the 13 years, we've now over, crossed over a million contributions in total, uh, with 100,000 contributions to our open source. So open source is not just a community mechanism, it's not just a licensing model, it's definitely a form of evolving the software and improving it as well, and we can demonstrate that at scale. Also as part of this, uh, we publish our financials online, and we are a profitable company, cash flow positive, and we get, as a result of that, that allows us to start having a very long-term mindset about what do we do next. We no longer need to raise money. We instead can focus on our customers and focus on our long-term horizon. And that has allowed uh, us to start thinking 10 years out. And 10 years out, you can start making substantial bets and really rethink and work on massive problems there. Now, we've already started this in some small ways. Uh, earlier this year, we announced 10-year long-term support for our customers. If you buy a subscription and you stay with us, we will support the version that you have for up to 10 years, right? There's not many vendors that will do that. The second is, is that three years ago, we started building our own programming language. This programming language is specially purpose designed to solve very uh, uh, modern day microservice architecture problems. And if you've ever been in and around programming languages, they take three to five years to nurture into a community and another five to 15 years to develop into mainstream adoption. Uh, we're playing down that path. We're committing to that level. So here's two things that we've done that's already demonstrating a 10 year uh, commitment, a bigger vision. But we think we can even articulate a bigger problem and go after an even bigger mission with you. And what would that be? So we started looking at all the projects that we've done. And we started off small, but now we're working on a lot of projects. As has been said, we now have over 550 employees in the company. Uh, we have them deployed uh, around the world. We now have offices in Sydney, uh, London, Manhattan, uh, Mountain View, Brazil, 
Uh, we're opening an office in Berlin later this year, and we also opened an office with a partner in Mexico. So lots of projects spread all around the world, amazing brands. So we decided to pull them and take a look and see what kind of trends we could find. And one of the most interesting trends was that when we started doing projects, we would work with our customers and we'd say, how, how fast can we release the software? How fast can we make a change in your environment? And it started off being months. Months, long months, very waterfall in its development. And it rapidly got better. You know, all through the first decade of this century, it came way down. And about five years ago, it got down to a couple of months. So a dramatic improvement. But in those past five years, it hasn't improved all that much. So you can sit there and say, okay, 1.7 months is a lot better than what it was, but I wouldn't necessarily call that agile. So we started looking around, and there is this major study done every year uh, the State of Agile Survey, and the 12th one was done just a, a few months ago, and, and there was an even more telling statistic in there, which they said 75% of all organizations around the planet, all software organizations around the planet, follow some form of agile practice. So everybody's doing it, but only 4% of those organizations report getting any adaptive benefits from their practices of agile. So over the past 15 years, or has it been 17 now, uh, the, the, the software development industry has transformed into this belief that agile development practices make us agile. But they don't. Forrester took this one step further. They do a survey to, uh, I think it's a, a 400 or 13, it's either 400 or 1300 developers each and every year. All these developers work inside of enterprises. And they ask them, how often do you release your apps? And over the past five years, what's happened is it's gone in reverse. 14% of those organizations released once a week or more five years ago. Now it's down to 9%. This data just came out a few weeks ago. Right? I would not call this as being agile. So, uh, interesting trend. Why is that? Right? Are teams just not understanding the fundamental principles? Right? Are they choosing not to do it? Well, we actually think that the nature of systems is what's getting in the way. So today, uh, which we call uh, a monolith approach, there's a very standard approach to how most organizations approach software development. You have a bunch of development teams, probably in some centralized development organization, and each of these development teams themselves are agile. They have the ability to be small, they can release independently on their own, but in order for them to release, they probably depend upon a layer of middleware. Some sort of integration backbone, maybe a message broker, some sort of shared data plane that you might have. But whatever it is, the people who own that middleware are usually specialty teams, some sort of center of excellence. And they have to manage those systems independently and in order for that application to deploy, they have to work and coordinate either with or through those teams for their app to eventually make it down to the ops team and the ops infrastructure, which also has its own requirements and releases. And so if you put all this stuff together, you know, this is a standard architecture that we have proven is very scalable. We've proven that it's very reliable but it creates interesting levels of organizational, technology, and cultural dependencies that make it hard to release. You fundamentally have these gates that create trickle-down cycles that you have to go to to get that code, which was agile, into production. Looks like a waterfall to me. Now, it might be fast waterfall, and the development teams feel like they're being agile, but that's a waterfall process. Turns out that middleware, oops, middleware is one of the biggest bottlenecks to agility, agility. All this technology we've built over the past 13 years, proven stable, proven secure, proven reliable, proven scalable, but the exact opposite of agile. So, Agility is not just having fantastic technology that scales, it's also great process and great people. 
So I mentioned a couple minutes ago about us being on a bigger mission, having a 10-year horizon. It's no longer just good enough for us to be a provider of integration technology that everybody's going to need. This technology will not get adopted if we cannot be the glue to every microservice that's out there. You cannot build microservices at that scale if you're releasing every 1.7 months. So our mission is going to not just provide the integration technology, but to do it in a way where you can be as agile as you want to be. We're going to make it possible so that you can iterate, release continuously, but still do integration. We call this integration agile. And it's going to be a combination of a technology stack that we're building and releasing, along with new processes and services and consultative offerings that will guide you to become as agile as you want to be. Now, how do we do that? The first is, is that we now are introducing what we call the WSO2 uh, maturity model for agility. This is a five-phase model, and we're going to have some sessions that overview this, overview this for you, um, that talk about all the different points that you go on a, on a journey path from either being a classic monolith all the way up to an integration agile environment. Now, there is no one right or wrong answer to this. Every organization needs to self-identify where they want to be. Right? Integration agility is not for everyone here. But in order to do this, we will guide you with exactly the self-assessment that you need to identify where you're at. And then we're also introducing a methodology for agility that will help you move from one stage to the next and guiding you with technology, reference approaches to architecture, and reference approaches to processes and culture that you need to adopt so that you can keep moving to the right. And all of this is backed by, also now we're introducing a WSO2 architecture for agility that outlines exactly the type of architecture you can deploy at each of these five phases. Asanka, who's giving one of the presentations later, is going to you know, outline exactly how you go about implementing these sorts of systems. But in, for, in order to do this architecture for agility, you can look at layered architectures of systems, segmented architectures for systems, or this new concept that we're also introducing at this conference, a cell-based reference architecture. And a cell-based reference architecture simply is this self-contained unit of architecture, a composable unit of architecture that not only contains your logic, but it also contains your integration capabilities, a control plane, and a data plane, so that a development team can independently develop, deploy, and manage a unit of architecture inside of an environment without needing to depend upon all those middleware gates and also without disrupting any other cells that are there. A cell-based reference architecture is a very novel concept. Uh, it's, a, it's been talked about lightly in a lot of the uh, uh, academic and online uh, thought leadership uh, circles. Uh, but we're baking this in fundamentally into our architecture of our products. And if you do that, what happens is that instead of having a monolith approach where you have these centers of excellence that act as dependencies for your applications, you can now tell your development teams to self-organize. And when they self-organize, they can build their own cells. They can use any programming language they want to build these cells, but if you use our programming language, Ballerina, it is special purpose designed to make these cells automatic. These cells will all have their own APIs that are exposed through API management, but those cells can then directly run on some sort of infrastructure that is based on orchestration. Pick your poison with Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, straight servers, it doesn't matter but they go directly onto an expanded ops infrastructure that has an event-based hybrid integration platform. And these cells can independently deploy on an iterative basis by coordinating with your DevOps team. And so with this sort of approach, we call this, this is a composable enterprise, and you can reallocate your budget and your technology from the center of excellence to an expanded development, expanded DevOps, an expanded ops team. So you have to deploy a different kind of architecture 
to get to that level of continuous deployment. And we are going to be the vendor that will support either architecture. You can do it either way with us, we'll do it completely in the open, and we're going to have the people, process, and tech that will guide you down this path. We are known for these four product pillars. Uh, enterprise integration was our first well, with our ESB. Uh, we also have identity and access management, API management, which is now our largest product overall, and analytics and stream processing. When you you know, use these products in an architecture, you're developing, reusing, running, and managing your integrations. And then we wrap that with the new maturity model, our new reference methodology and reference architecture, and all this together, we call this the WSO2 Integration Agile Platform. Right? This is our overall product offering. This is what we're taking to the market. Now, inside of this platform, uh, we build a lot of stuff. We have uh, technology components, as we will, that provide a, a complete spectrum on the life cycle of development. Um, our, our ESB is still a classic mechanism for doing transformations and mediation at large scale. Uh, we have a number of other technologies that the presenters at this conference um, are going to be talking about in uh, great detail. Uh, and increasingly, we are uh, getting a lot more exposure on the governance front with API gateways, API management storefronts, a lot of API analytics. Uh, it's a big and substantial part of our business because every integration that you do at this point becomes an API, and so that API needs governance and that's API management. At the beginning of July, uh, we did our quarterly release. We release our entire platform stack all at the same time so that it's a coordinated release. And this quarter's theme was all about microservices. One, we converted our entire uh, stack so that you can run it in a microservice architecture if you want. Uh, but two, we introduced on our API management uh, a concept of a micro gateway. Uh, this is a very important concept, whereas with a macro gateway, you have a single system that manages all your APIs in a central location. With micro gateways, you can now have a gateway per API if you want. So you can have a farm of gateways that collectively work together to provide management capabilities at different levels of your system based upon your organizational demands. So microservices architectures are a way uh, for us to start enabling hundreds thousands or even tens of thousands of integrations in a very agile approach. So we're going to have lots of sessions that talk about this Q2 release. I mentioned Ballerina. It's a programming language. We call it a cloud native programming language. It is designed uh, with microservices in mind. Uh, it is the first language that is special purpose designed uh, to help you build services and programs that are going to talk over a network in a resilient way. It's actually aware that APIs exist. It's aware that you're talking to an endpoint. It's aware that there's a transactional environment. And so as a result, the amount of code that you have to write to create very resilient microservices has come way down. Now, we're designing Ballerina to be special purpose fit for helping you not just create the things that run inside of cells, but you're gonna be able to use Ballerina to create cells. A developer writes some code, he compiles, and what comes out of it is a complete cell with all of the capabilities inside of it, all that middleware stuff inside the runtime of the cell without your teams having to do anything other than compile some code. So it's a very important initiative for us. Uh, it has been something that we've been incubating for three years. Uh, we put it out as a production-ready version in May of this year. We consider it production-grade. We have paying customers for this language. They are uh, writing this language, they are putting it into production. They are, this is a Fortune 500 customer, they're not ready to be named yet, but they're big and they're doing development with that. And we're very rapidly running towards what we would consider our 1.0 version of Ballerina that we think will happen towards the end of this year. And the only distinction between the Ballerina that we're shipping now and the 1.0 difference is that at that point in time, we'll make it backwards compatible so that the code in the future will not have to be rewritten. We're still fine tuning a couple of important points, but at this point in time, very much stable, very much performant, and getting adoption out into the marketplace. 
We had our first ballerina con where we had 300 people attend in July. It was a wonderful and fantastic event in San Francisco. Um, I'm a little bit over the moon. Uh, I'm, I'm from San Francisco. Uh, if you're not aware, uh, the San Francisco Ballet is the oldest um, a ballet company in the United States of America. Uh, it's one of the largest schools of ballet anywhere in the world. And we gave them a charitable contribution um, at BallerinaCon, and they sent a couple of their professional dancers uh, to perform for us. And it was particularly exciting for us because they informed us that we were the first tech company in the history of Silicon Valley to ever give them a donation. <laughs> and I just, you know, the 60-year history of that place that we've been in, and, and they were just so thankful because somebody thought of them <laughs> Uh, to give them that donation. So we were, we were very proud of that, and there's this fantastic video online of, of, uh, the, uh, of that dance that they gave, and, and we're going to have a partnership with them for quite a while. Um, if you're interested, but you are uh, someone who says it's an early programming language, I don't know if I can adopt that, uh, you can work with us. Uh, we have an early access development support program. It's super cheap. It gets you unlimited amount of support, uh, and all you have to do is tell the world that you're using Ballerina. So uh, it is available now. Uh, you can talk to your friendly account manager. They will figure out how you go about and engaging with us on that. Also in July, we introduced a serverless solution. Uh, we, you know, we, we see a tremendous um, interest in serverless technologies primarily driven by organizations that are interested in uh, understanding how they can have per request pricing models for their internal systems. So that the systems spin themselves up when a request comes in, they spin themselves down when the request is done. And serverless uh, programming models offer a way to build that sort of capability into your infrastructure. Um, and we've got an early access serverless solution that we've built uh, that combines our products together with uh, Apache OpenWhisk, which is a functions as a service uh, core engine. And, and we offer this in a managed service capability uh, to experiment with on how you might start doing using functions programming model to achieve serverless architectures in an integration backbone. Uh, we made some other announcements uh, on, on more of the business side. So I mentioned that we now do 10-year long-term support. Uh, we also introduced a technical account manager program. A technical account manager is a full-time dedicated resource that works with your organization to deal with whatever support issues you have. They can be remote, they can be on-premise, uh, and a lot of our larger customers are started to engage us with that so that they can have that full-time touch. Uh, we're a subscription business. Uh, we also introduced evaluation subscriptions, so you can get a, uh, a trial to experience what our support relationship is like and what our update management system does for you on a technology basis. So that was pretty cool. Uh, but probably the biggest news that we made is historically, all of our products or our subscriptions have been priced on a VM basis. Um, and as architectures have skinnied themselves down, uh, we increasingly have customers who are deploying our products as containers um, or variations of containers. And VM-based pricing is not the most convenient. So we introduced a new platform license. And this allows you to purchase subscriptions of our products by counting the number of cores uh, that they're deployed on, as opposed to the number of VMs. So it's still a consumption-based approach to our subscriptions, uh, but we've narrowed it down to a core-based counting as opposed to VM-based counting. I mentioned that we opened an office earlier this year in Australia. It's uh, one of our closest <laughs> remote offices that's there. Uh, we've got a full-time staff. We're pretty excited about being there. Uh, what, what makes this particularly exciting for us is that we have a huge open banking initiative. Uh, if you're not aware, the Australian regulators have uh, you know, really uh, clamped down and declared that they're, all of their 130 or so financial institutions have to have APIs and open access to all their systems, and none of those banks are prepared for that. So we've built a special purpose open banking solution uh, that's targeted for the Australian market, and so we've established an office there that's gonna sell our classic portfolio, sell this open banking portfolio, and we're gonna have a lot of fun and success. 
And we also opened an office in Mexico with local presence, local speaking uh, personalities. This pairs well with our Brazilian office. And Brazil and Latin America overall is our fastest growing territory around the world, growing about 150% year over year. So great, two more offices. Uh, we'll open up Berlin this year. And given the sort of growth that we're experiencing, there's probably going to be another two offices next year as well. We also introduced a completely new partner program. Uh, when we were having our luncheon a little bit earlier, a number of partners came up and introduced themselves. Uh, we're particularly excited about this. We've always had a referral program. You know, you, you bring business to us and we'll give you a referral in exchange. But now we're introducing a reseller program so that if you are a value-added reseller or a software vendor yourself, you can sell our subscriptions, you can sell our services to your own customers, and we can enter into that relationship with you, and you can build an annuity stream, a recurring revenue stream, uh, by working with us to sell our products on your behalf. So that was a lot of work by our internal team. Uh, we rolled that out, and it offers a lot more flexibility and a lot more different programs that you can fit into so that you can start building a bigger business with us, and we can help you do that. So I hope you have a great week. Uh, uh, Hasman is absolutely correct that you, you got to participate in the parties. Um, I, I, I'm a fairly, you know, kind of conservative and boring individual, and but this team that I get to work with, these guys are crazy, and uh, they, they, you get a little alcohol in our employees here, and they they go a little nutty on the dance floor. I gotta say, so uh, if you haven't been to the party, you should party with them. Um, the, it, I, I will be there, I will not be on the dance floor. Uh, we're going to have a networking event tonight. Today is a lot of keynotes, tomorrow are a lot of technical sessions and tracks. Uh, I think we're all doing the ballerina day uh, later this week. Uh, if you have any engineers or technologists, uh, definitely get them signed up and participate, just so you can see what it's like to be in a room with 800 people programming at the same time here. Uh, but with that, I hope that uh, my enthusiasm and my infection has convinced you a little bit about why I think that integration is sexy, why Massimo thinks integration is sexy. Hopefully you start to think that is as well. I hope I get to spend some time with each of you uh, throughout the next two days and, and we get to know each other a little bit better. Um, and with that, thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce our next speecher, uh, speaker, who's from MAS Holdings, and it's Jahan. Thank you.